right now. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the uh, February Parkinson's Diner with Dr. Amber Van Lauren, Dr. Victor Van Lauren, and some other, I just saw a cat go by Sandy's screen. How lovely. So welcome everyone. And I think it's going to be a really interesting topic today regarding COVID-19. And I welcome all of you. I will hand it over to Dr. Amber and Dr. Victor. And as always, um, they cannot give any um, specific medical advice. This is more of an educational talk. Thank awesome. you both. Thank you, Casey. So I'm gonna get the presentation shared here. Oh, hold on a second. Do this, the swap display is you. The one thing COVID has not changed is technical difficulties. So, <laughs> all right. Hi, everyone. So this question has come up quite a bit, as you might imagine, over the last two years. Um, <clears throat> and the reality is we're only now starting to learn a lot about this. So we want to talk uh, today about um, COVID-19 and having COVID-19 and having PD. Now, let's see if this actually works. There we go. All right, so let's just start with the basics. I'm sure most of you know by now, but um, for those of you who may still have some questions, what exactly is COVID-19? So COVID-19 is actually the disease or the syndrome that's caused by a virus. And that virus is a coronavirus. Um, coronaviruses are everywhere. Um, there are virus, coronaviruses cause the common cold. There are some that cause um, respiratory syndromes. And then there are the ones that were really well known because they cause bad, severe acute respiratory syndromes such as SARS and MERS. Um, and then fall of 2019, a new coronavirus came to light. This SARS-CoV-2 is what it ended up being called because of its similarity to the SARS virus. And the disease that it called was called coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19. And that's where the term COVID-19 really comes from. Um, so the symptoms are what really make COVID-19 different from honestly every other virus that we've seen on a global scale. Um, the symptoms can appear anywhere from two days after the virus is contracted to 14 days after the virus is contracted. And what really makes this different is the fact that it can still be contagious before symptoms even show up. And that's some of what lended to COVID-19 spreading around the globe as fast as it did. Um, and the symptoms are not too dissimilar from things like the common cold or the flu. The irritant you know, fever, often starts with a dry cough, but can be a, a wet, deep cough, a shortness of breath, difficulty of breathing. But sometimes these can these symptoms can become much more severe, um, causing patients to need to seek medical attention at the hospital for uh, breathing assistance, oxygen. Um, and we do have, unlike many of these other coronaviruses I just mentioned, for uh, SARS-CoV-2 for COVID-19, we now have several FDA-approved vaccines to protect from severe illness. Okay. Um, another thing that makes COVID-19 unique is that it mutates a lot. And there are several what we call variants of COVID-19 that are out there. Some of them are far more contagious than others, like Delta and Omicron, the one that's causing the big spike in cases right now. And they're still out there. They're still spreading around. So 
where is COVID-19 at right now as far as COVID, as far as cases of COVID-19? Well, the good news is the cases are going down really fast. So they spiked here um, over the, across the new year, um, in large part because of this very fast spreading, highly contagious Omicron variant. But just within the last two weeks, they've dropped nearly 50%. Now this is, this is great news. It means that that variant at least may be burning itself out. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people are excited because so many states and everything are starting to drop mask mandates, things like that. Um, oh, sorry. Because this has been a very significant drop. I mean, we just got done with the highest peak in cases we've seen this entire pandemic. But I want to caution everyone that case numbers are still really high. Even though they've dropped a ton from the current peak, they're still higher than nearly any other time during the entire two year pandemic right now. Um, and unfortunately, um, the death rate from COVID-19 is still really high. So it's still here. The original Delta, Omicron, they're still out there. They're still circulating around. But um, right now, at least, things are on a downswing. It's a big part of the reason I think it's time to have this conversation is just so we have some sense. We've had a couple of years now to figure out how this is or isn't affecting um, patients living with Parkinson's because this is something we're just going to live with, I think, is I, the, the general sense that everyone's getting right now. Exactly. So let's talk about that. What happens for those who get COVID-19 that also have Parkinson's disease? Well, what do the data say? And the truth is at the moment, it's actually not an easy answer. Because yes, we've had two years, but we've only had two years. Um, there have been a ton of papers published on COVID obviously, but there's also been a ton of papers published on COVID and Parkinson's disease. Now that's great because it means there's a ton of data out there, but that's a very short amount of time for the amount of papers. There's almost 1500 um, articles on PubMed alone that are just PD and COVID. And when we see that many papers come out on a single topic in that short of amount of time, especially a topic this complicated, one has to question the scientific rigor that some of those papers went through when they were being reviewed. Um, that doesn't mean the data is bad. It just means we need to give a lot of this stuff a second look before we can really sort out what is real and what's not. Um, and some, of, some people have started doing this already, uh, what we call meta-analysis, where they take all the papers and review it and try to come down to what seems to be the common theme. There's been a couple of those that come out that are really good. And there's been, and probably one of the more reliable things that we have right now are patient surveys, just going out and asking Parkinson's patients, have you had COVID? How have you dealt with it? And the benefit of the surveys is we can get a large number of people really quick because a lot of people have had COVID. I think the other big takeaway from this though, too, is it just shows like something was going on. Like Parkinson's patients were saying something was there. And that, I think that's why we saw so much of this in the news and in, um, you know, just chats online with other support groups, that sort of thing. So there's, there's something to this. And so I, I hope we can dissect this a little bit for you today and, and explain, uh, I think what we think, some idea of what we think is going on. And like Amber said at the start, if you have any questions as we go along, please put them in the chat. Um, we're happy to stop and answer them or answer them all at the end. Um, but we, we definitely want this to be not just a lecture, but a real open discussion because we know this is a topic that's on a lot of people's minds. So what effect does COVID-19 have on Parkinson's symptoms? So this is probably the biggest question, honestly. And it's probably the reason that so many people are curious about this. Probably one of the best sources as for right now is this massive survey that was conducted by the Michael J. Fox Foundation, um, where they surveyed um, over 7,200 patients. This was early on in the pandemic, about the middle of uh, 2020. Um, and this would be before we had any vaccines. We were only starting to understand that masking was helping. Um, and what the survey found was that uh, people who had PD who then got COVID 
um, often experienced worse symptoms. Um, over 63% of those surveyed that, had, that got COVID um, said that they had worsening motor symptoms or even some new motor symptoms that they didn't have before. Um, and a surprising 75% said they had new or worsening non-motor symptoms that they had not experienced before. Another interesting thing that came out of the survey was from people who didn't get COVID. And what they found there is that 40 to 50% of patients said they experienced worsening of motor and non-motor symptoms if they didn't have COVID. Um, and this seems to be attributed to specifically people that didn't get COVID, but kept themselves in a quarantine lockdown state. So that may have contributed to this. I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. I just wanted to highlight again, I mean, the, the fact that the Fox Foundation got involved with this, again, just highlights that there was, I think, um, an outcry from the Parkinson's community to, to have some understanding about this. And, you know, and I, the theme I want to, another theme I want to try and get across today is that any illness, no matter if it's COVID or the flu or anything, um, has the opportunity to worsen symptoms. We, we consider this to be a temporary worsening. Um, you know, but these are um, in other situations that it's actually just this, you get sick and it allows the, the symptoms to kind of pop through a bit more. Um, so I think you'll see that we're going to be bringing that up a lot today. Yeah. And uh, so as she just said, it, it, it's, it's just really well known amongst the medical community that um, Parkinson's patients tend to have a worsening of their symptoms. Most movement disorder patients have a worsening of their motor and Parkinsonian symptoms with any infection, with any kind of temporary disease. And the reasons for this are still a little unclear. It may have to do with um, you know, how the body's metabolizing medicines. It may have to do with just fatigue, sim simply. Um, but I, it's, a known, it's a known event that we still don't understand very clearly. I mean, even, even things like bladder infections will have some of the same consequences. You know, typically what we advise is that we expect symptoms that are there will get worse. You know, we don't typically see, we wouldn't expect new symptoms to show up per se um, with an infection. And you know, so I think, you know, taking into account some of what um, was found in this uh, Michael J. Fox survey, it, did reserve, it deserves, you know, further consideration evaluation, especially since we, you know, have concerns with COVID having particular um, consequences in the brain. Um, but just, just to be clear, I mean, there's, this can happen with just about the most common of, of um, in, infections. Um, but again, we typically you know, advise patients that this is just usually a worsening of stuff that's already there. Buttons aren't working, I apologize. Um, and when it comes to COVID-19, and this is the point I really wanna make, is that a lot of this, when we put all the studies together, so far, there doesn't seem to be anything specific about COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2 virus that makes it especially worse for PD. Um, it, it seems to be having the same effects on motor symptoms that a lot of infections do, but there doesn't seem to be th anything that it's doing extra to make Parkinson's worse. Now, when it comes to those worsening of symptoms that, the, that patients that didn't get COVID had, um, we, again, it's still not very clear why, but it's most likely um, based on some patient and doctor interviews that it's uh, due to the effects of the social isolation itself, just disrupting the normal activity of people's daily lives. They can't go to the gym, they you know, aren't hanging out with friends that they may do regularly. Um, and again, that's something that's going to disrupt anyone, but um, especially for those, for PD patients, this can have a massive effect on symptoms that may be, were being alleviated by these um, activities and social interactions. It, there's, there's actually some really great data, and some have actually came out of Pittsburgh, um, you know, looking at um, ways to slow down disease progression and, and things like exercise. I mean, these are things that we, we talk about regularly, but you know, I think it's increasingly clear that the social aspect is is as as important, really. Um, you know, and it's it's even even if it's not people to people interaction, there's evidence that even pets 
just having that that another another you know, being to be with you to help with this. The, the social piece is a huge deal, um, you know, especially as we age, um, and particularly for women that who are tend to be more social creatures. You know, this is a, a really important piece that we need to keep in mind. I think may have gotten lost. Absolutely. So, where do the vaccines come in? So, um, now, I, I want to make this very clear. Currently, there's no evidence that the vaccines would have any long-term effect on anyone, but in particular, not on Parkinson's patients or Parkinson's patients' symptoms. Um, now, it is typical. Parkinson's patients have been reporting that they um, are experiencing maybe a temporary worsening of their Parkinson's symptoms, as well as, you know, what are the normal side effects for any vaccine? Uh, headache, fever, chills, nausea, but these are all temporary. Everything so far has been recorded that it's all temporary, clearing up within a few days, if not less. And there's um, no in change in the rate of, of what symptoms show up or when, that's all seems to be pretty standard across um, the board with, with or without Parkinson's. My dog. So uh, one thing that has become very clear since the vaccinations became available, the vaccines became available, is that being vaccinated is being associated with a lower risk of hospitalization or um, severe symptoms or death in all people, but in particularly with the uh, Parkinson's patients. Um, uh, was there more that you wanted to say about uh, the vaccine as well? Yeah, I mean, there's, I think there were, I, I could see in some of the, like the online groups that there was some concerns that this was um, a cause of Parkinson's. And, um, you know, I think we have enough evidence at this point to suggest that that's, that's not the case. Um, that being said, you know, there are plenty of situations where um, there is a certain stressor. It could be something physical. It could be something more emotional. Mm -hmm. And someone will say, I suddenly got Parkinson's disease. And that's, that's usually not what happens. It's really this, um, an issue of there was probably something already going on there. And, you know, the, 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 the new situation just brought those symptoms out even more. And when it comes to the vaccines in particular, um, you know, a lot of these reports flying around have made a lot of people hesitant to want to get the vaccines for whatever reason. Um, but uh, in particular, um, the, the rapidity with which the vaccine was made available. Um, and I, I think it's important to point out that the science that created the most popular vaccines that are out right now, the, the Pfizer and the Moderna mRNA vaccines, that si that, that's actually not new science. Um, researching this type of vaccine has been going on for nearly two decades. Um, it's just that the resources that were put behind making this vaccine um, are what allowed it to be developed so quickly. And what we really saw here wasn't a sudden slapdash creation of a vaccine. What we saw here is what we've wanted after decades of investing in biomedical science, the ability to use our science and our technology that we've learned to create a response like this very, very quickly. And the dream always was, hey, if we get a new disease, let's get a vaccine or a cure out within a year. And we actually did it for the first time. Um, time will tell, obviously, what's best, what's working, but people shouldn't be afraid of the science. Yeah, we've been really building off of many, many years of, of experience here, just, just to try to give some perspective on, on where we are now. So with that, oh, one important thing I do want to make, like this isn't a cure for COVID. Vaccines are just that. They are a vaccine. With any disease, with any virus that you're vaccinated against, you can still catch the virus. The vaccine just makes it so that your body responds to it quicker. Um, the risk, what's really going on with this vaccine in particular, is that the risk of getting severe symptoms from COVID is greatly reduced with the vaccine.
But did you have anything to add? Or? Um, there was there was just a comment about this article that the mRNA vaccine can somehow cause a pro, prion like um, reactions that you could get spreading of neurogenic disease, um, and I think that this is a, a really far stretch of of the the science here, and um, I, I do not believe that to be the case based off and, of my understanding of the disease progression. And I'm actually going to get into that later, so I will address that. So um, one concern is whether having Parkinson's makes people more at risk for getting COVID or more at risk for being hospitalized with COVID. So again, because there's been so much data, so many small studies, everyone trying to get something published, this has been a data point that's been really difficult to pin down. Um, just because, again, as I mentioned, there were lots of studies. Most of them were like local hospitals saying, oh, here's my dozen Parkinson's patients and what I saw. Um, and so the range of data is everything. You can find papers that say everything from, it actually reduces the risk of getting COVID to it makes it 50% higher that you're gonna get COVID. Um, when we put all the studies together, it does not appear that having Parkinson's increases your risk for getting COVID. Um, uh, the Parkinson's population seems to be at the same general risk as the rest of the general population, about a five to 7% risk of contracting symptomatic disease. Now, there do appear to be, however, an increased risk of hospitalization from cracking COVID-19 with Parkinson's disease. Um, and Often, if the symptoms require hospitalization, there seems to also be an increased risk of having very severe COVID-19 symptoms or disease, Parkinson's or COVID-19 disease-related complications and death. So there are increased risks associated with the COVID-19 and Parkinson's. And I, I gotta say, actually, in the especially in the early days um, of 2020, this is a lot of what we saw, you know, that just having Parkinson's by itself with any kind of illness puts you at an increased risk, um, you know, and for a variety of reasons. But, you know, I, I think, you know, that this is why it's important to have like discussions about before going to the hospital, knowing that, you know, your Parkinson's is a, is a piece of the medical history and is really relevant and makes it a little bit different than someone else coming in the hospital with, you know, COVID-19 or something else that doesn't have Parkinson's. You know, and, and just, um, you know, it's a slight increased risk for certain kind of complications, let's say. And that actually is a really good segue to the fact that we don't really know why there's a higher risk of the severe COVID-19 and hospitalization associated with PD. And it could be tied to several factors. It's all neurodegenerative diseases and for all the reasons you're about to list. That's absolutely right. Um, so one, one thought is it's the, it's the age that the Parkinson's population being already a, a older age that an age, age we already know is a risk factor for COVID-19 in and of itself. Um, or the severity of the PD or the PD symptoms uh, that the patient already has prior to COVID-19. Um, or having other diseases or disorders um, with her in addition to Parkinson's. Um, and these are all things that may be screened the data towards a higher risk. Um, so, and, and as Amber said, this, this would apply to any disease, any neurogenic disease. Um, just as an example, and again, I'm giving this as a one-off example. Um, one of the small studies that I'm talking about, the Hartford Healthcare um, System in Connecticut, uh, their movement disorder center, which is a really large Movement Disorder Center on the East Coast uh, conducted a study across their hospital system. Um, again, they, while they didn't find an increased risk for getting COVID, they also saw an increased risk for requiring hospitalization with PD. Um, and they noted like, very significantly that the risk was even higher for patients with dementia that caught COVID. Now, again, this is just one example of how this could be influenced by other factors. Because um, is it the dementia? Is it, a, is it a brain reason for COVID or is it because these patients took longer to seek help or 
had other health care issues or self care issues. So we, we need time to really go through all the data and see what the common threads were um, to evaluate a lot of this. But for sure, one of the common threads is um, an increased risk of a more severe disease, a uh, case of COVID-19. We, we know that, you know, having Parkinson's itself lends to some more complications for any type of hospitalization or illness, but the dementia component on top of that just increases that risk even further. And I, and I think some of this may be, um, it, there's just overall not as healthy. You know, we call, we call it the, the neurologic reserve just isn't as good. Um, and that it's, it's easier to tip people over, um, you know, into having more severe illness when you have these comorbidities. So there's multiple other um, medical health problems that are going on. I think there's also been some thought that the immune system just doesn't work as well. I mean, this can happen with aging by itself, um, but I think that, you know, we still need to look into this and we've had other conversations about this, but that the immune system may not be able to keep up either. So, what about those that have had COVID-19? Um, and another trend that we're seeing is that it can be a slow recovery for some people. Um, this also came out of that Michael J. Fox Foundation um, survey um, that many of the patients that had COVID-19 hospitalized or not reported they had a long recovery, longer than they were expecting after uh, having COVID-19. And not just from the COVID symptoms, they also reported a long recovery to get back to the baseline of their PD symptoms as well. Um, but there's good reason to believe that these lingering effects of COVID-19 um, of the worsening symptoms during it should ultimately be surmountable, um, at least as far as the Parkinson's disease is concerned, because we don't have any evidence that the COVID-19 is doing anything bad to the brain. We don't have any evidence that it's changing the course of the PD. We don't have any evidence that it's making more neurons die or doing anything worse. Um, and for the most part, a lot of the medical community expects patients to return to their baseline. Um, now, what does this mean for long haul COVID, um, which a lot of patients are also experiencing? Um, honestly, this is a new disease, so we don't know. Um, we don't really know what long haul COVID is going to mean. Um, so it's something that the medical community is going to have to keep an eye on over the next few years. Okay. So here's an interesting thing that really spurred a lot of this research in neurodegenerative disease and COVID-19, and in particular, Parkinson's and COVID-19, um, is these early reports suggesting does COVID-19 cause Parkinson's disease? Um, so what does COVID-19 really mean for PD risk? Well, early on, like again, early in 2020, um, these cases started being reported where people reported that they were having Parkinsonisms or straight up Parkinson's disease um, in otherwise healthy people um, after they caught COVID-19. Now, I wanna, I, I state that because it was all over the news and everything, I, I remember it coming out, but to date, there's actually only been three cases in the literature reported of people having Parkinsonism after they had COVID-19. Uh, of the billions of people that have caught this disease, only three here in the US have been reported to have a Parkinsonism afterwards. Um, notably, they were all young onset for getting Parkinson's, but for two of the patients, um, uh, later imaging and other um, neurological assessments showed that they actually did have Parkinson's. They were just very early stage of pre-symptomatic and the COVID-19, as Amber pointed out earlier, probably unmasked the symptoms that were already underlying. Um, there's only one that they possibly related the virus and that's purely based on time course. The fact that they got a Parkinsonism, they recovered most of their symptoms after the 14 day course of COVID ran its course, and the imaging didn't back up that they had Parkinson's, but that patient's still being evaluated. So um, the, the link that COVID-19 causes Parkinson's, not a good link. And, you know, and honestly, I think 
the the truth will come out in time. That being said, you know, again, COVID coronaviruses have been around forever. We've all we, a lot of us have been exposed to many of them over time. And you know, this is what I was trying to say earlier is that for I've seen I've personally had lots of conversations with patients where they're like, you know, I got this thing and then I got Parkinson's. And in fact, it really suggests that there was already a process in play um, that put them at risk for Parkinson's. And it turns out, you know, for a lot of these cases, it just takes something to push the system over to make the symptoms really kind of rear their ugly head and come out. Um, but there is there really isn't anything like an acute you know, onset of, of Parkinson's. It usually suggests there was something else was going on and the, um, the patient was just able to handle or um, you know, kind of pretend like the symptoms weren't there or they were blaming them for on other things. Um, so just to, I mean, and again, this is a, a frequent conversation we've had in clinics before. Um, now, other reports have suggested that the COVID-19 virus is making its way to the brain, that it is causing infections in the brain. Um, there was one study that showed that there was an increase in COVID uh, coronavirus antibodies um, in the brain fluid, in the cerebral spinal fluid. Um, another thing that came up was the fact that loss of taste and smell are early symptoms in the original variant. So people were concerned, oh, it's getting into the brain through the nose and killing off those neurons. Um, and this raised concern, obviously, because we've seen something like this before. A hundred years ago with the Spanish flu, um, a lot of people did get brain infections and it led to a condition called uh, Ence Encephalitis lethargica, which is a Parkinsonian dystonia type order. Um, we all probably know or remember the movie Awakenings where this specific um, disease was front and center in these patients. But to date, you know, two years into the pandemic, we haven't seen anything like this. And, and if this were the case, we probably would start seeing it right now. Yeah, and again, it, again, with coronavirus as being so prevalent in our in our world, um, you know, again, it seems like we we would have seen something by now just from other coronaviruses. But yes, even with two years, and we have you know pretty good track on on um, patients with with Parkinson's, and we're just not seeing a clear link right now in the number of Parkinson's cases. We're not seeing a big increase in spite of a huge you know influx of of COVID. And I actually just put into the the chat, you know, that. Um, I, I'm not concerned with an mRNA causing a spike protein that's prion, prion you know, spreading. I'm actually more worried about this kind of situation. This makes a lot more sense. We have a historical precedent for something like this. And I need to add on top of that, you know, though there was this clear, the Spanish flu that had this Parkinson's-like um, type of situation, this is not Parkinson's disease. And so even when we're talking about um, including patients in trials, we actually would not include someone like this because it's not the same underlying pathology as kind of run of the mill Parkinson's disease. It's, it's just different. But I, I think there's theoretically, there's good reason to think there's again, precedent here historically to suggest that maybe, maybe this is possible, but again, you know, time will tell, but we just haven't seen it yet. And I just want to make a side point. It's, it's actually interesting that even to this day, um, I will have students in classes at OSU, so college students who are interested in neurodegenerative diseases, they'll come up to me and say, oh, Parkinson's disease, like in that movie Awakenings. And, and I have to say, no, no, it's a, it's a completely different disease, completely different pathology. Um, it wasn't, it's neurodegeneration, but it was acute caused by an infection. It's, um, so even though the same drug worked, it didn't work well, and it's a completely different case. And maybe it speaks to the, again, in this interplay between the immune system and neurology, it's very similar to some of the, the other topics we've discussed in the past. Like there's something something here um, that, that isn't to be ignored, um, you know, but again, I, it, it's just a, a different beast altogether. So getting to, that idea of, oh, hey, these things could potentially trigger prion-like disorders. So a paper did come out last week. Actually, a couple of papers have come out um, because so many people are concerned about this potential link between PD and COVID that, of course, a lot of labs have started looking into whether there's even anything there on a biological level. Now, before I go into this, I want to point out 
Again, this is early in the research phase. Um, so hear me out before, <laughs> um, as, we, as we go through this. So the paper did come out, uh, several, trying to see if there's any kind of cellular level link between the virus and something that may contribute to Parkinson's. So one in particular uh, suggested that a protein on um, the virus could be causing alpha-synuclein, which is a protein we know is involved in Parkinson's disease, to form its you know, prion-like aggregated state. Um, and here are pictures of from that paper, um, the yellow being where alpha-synuclein has aggregated after this one protein. In particular, the N protein was introduced to these cells. Um, now, just a quick rundown of virus structure here. Uh, it's really simplified. Um, the capsid or the vessel that the virus uses to get into our cells has proteins on the outside and on the inside. On the outside, you have the spike protein or the S protein. That's what actually grabs onto cells so it can get inside. Um, then you have your membrane and envelope proteins that just hold it together. And then you have what's called the nucleocapsid protein or the N protein. This is a protein inside that keeps the mRNA from falling apart. That's the part that goes into your cell and makes more virus. That's just, that's what all viruses do. That's how infections work. Um, now this study found that specifically it was this N protein, this protein that is inside um, that seemed to be triggering this. When they tried the S protein, the spike protein, nothing happened in this study. Um, and I wanna point out that the vaccines use a part, not the whole, but a part of the spike protein as their immunogen to try to trigger an immune response. No one to date has been trying to use the N protein in a vaccine. So while this is very compelling data for something that might be happening inside the cell, I again want to stress that this is an early study and it's a very artificial study. Um, specifically, part of it was in a test tube using just purified N protein and purified alpha-synuclein which it may not even be biologically relevant depending on what the alpha nuclein was like because we know it's really hard to get pure alpha nuclein that behaves like cellular alpha nuclein does in our body. Um, and even in the cell pictures that I have here, these were cultured cells, they're not neurons. Um, and the N protein was literally injected into the cell. Like they had to actually use a little needle and put it inside the cell to trigger this. Um, so while the results are definitely something we need to look at, we need to be aware of, um, there's a lot more work that needs to happen to see if this is even relevant inside the human body. Um, and again, if COVID really was triggering this, we probably would have seen evidence of it by now. Um, so, the studies that have come out so far, these are all in experimental models. So cells in a dish, um, purified proteins. Um, there's some evidence that COVID-19 could be affecting um, brain regions, specific brain regions or disease-related proteins, but there's really just not a strong link yet between COVID-19 and actual brain damage that would lead to neurodegenerative disease, in particular Parkinson's disease. We, we haven't seen it yet. Um, and, and a good example of this is, you know, people point out, oh, well, what about the loss of smell and, and the infection of those neurons? Yes, but generally when those neurons die, if they die, you don't get your smell back. But the patients with COVID-19 by and large recover their sense of taste and smell after the disease has run its course, indicating that it actually didn't cause those neurons to die. It was infecting something else around them. And as Amber pointed out, we haven't seen, it's been two years and we haven't seen this massive rise in Parkinson's numbers we would have expected. Um, I saw one paper cite that we would have expected as many as 10,000 more PD cases in the US alone within the last year if, if this was causing a rapid progression of Parkinson's and we did not see that. 
just like statistically modeling this, that was the prediction. And I saw those papers coming out in again, like mid 2020. Um, and so everyone's been on alert, like we've been watching and anymore with like the electronic uh, medical records that we keep, there's just diagnostic code. So it's really easy for us to just kind of go through and, you know, look quickly at um, the, the numbers just, just from that. It's not perfect, but it definitely gives you a sense of, is there an uptick? And again, just, just haven't seen it. So the bottom line here that we have for today is that the long-term consequences of this virus, of SARS-CoV-2, and its impact, if any, on the burden of Parkinson's remains unknown. But there's certainly nothing acute, and there's certainly no evidence yet that it is doing anything nefarious in any kind of rapid fashion, other than the typical worsening of symptoms. Short within term. Yeah. Short term, temporarily. So our key takeaways from our COVID-19 and Parkinson's presentation today. Um, that you don't have Parkinson's patients don't have an increased risk of contracting COVID-19, but there may be an increased risk for severe symptoms and hospitalization with COVID-19 and Parkinson's. Um, and this risk may vary from patient to patient, depending on age and other conditions the patient has. Um, but we have a lot of evidence that vaccination may reduce this risk of severe COVID-19, in particular, um, the complications that lead to hospitalization and death. Yes, PD symptoms do tend to worsen with COVID-19, but this is true of a lot of infections, not just COVID. And there doesn't seem to be anything specific about SARS-CoV-2 that make it particularly worse for neurodegenerative disease or Parkinson's disease. Um, some patients do see a worsening of their non-motor symptoms, um, even if they don't get COVID. And this may just be linked to social isolation tied to the disease. Um, most patients recover from this after a temporary worsening of symptoms. And it might take a while for some people, um, but by and large, it should be surmountable as time goes on. I think many people in the audience today have probably known that it, not recovering from just even a common cold as well as you may have many years before. I think that's pretty common and, and to be expected. And I, I got to say, I'm actually really concerned with the social isolation. I, you know, I'm hearing from a lot of people, this is such a big problem. I'm hoping, you know, I'm seeing more and more, you know, um, you know, people getting together and a lot more an understanding that this is a, a critical factor in trying to overcome this. So um, just to remember, it's even if it's a phone call, you know, even those little bits can help, um, you know, but just don't let that be forgotten as a really important component of, of uh, overall management of Parkinson's. Yeah. And one question that is often posed to scientists and doctors is, well, if we know social isolation was you know, a problem or that socialization is so much better, then why did we go into the lockdowns and quarantines to start with? What's different now? And the answer is a lot is different now. We understand the disease better. We understand what steps we can take to lower the risk of catching the disease. We have medicines to treat it if you get it. We have vaccines to make it less severe if you get it. We didn't have that um, even a year and a half ago. Even a year ago, we didn't have a lot of that. So that's what's changed. The early isolations in quarantine were to slow this down enough that we didn't cause a complete collapse of our healthcare system. And while the healthcare system has suffered a lot, it's still running in a large part to a lot of the mitigations that were taken early. Um, but Moving forward, you know, we have a lot more tools in the back. So we're gonna see, a, hopefully see changes to how things are approached. Now, as far as the risk of developing Parkinson's, the jury's still out. This is gonna be one of those things that we're gonna be watching for years. Um, now, as far as those cases where, oh, I got Parkinson's after COVID-19, it may simply be unmasking symptoms that the patient already had or was going to have. Um, that, that's what the evidence is suggesting so far. But really, this is one of those cases where more time is going to be needed, more science is going to be needed to really see if there's a connection, if any. I just, I think, you know, we really just wanted to show that you know, we've learned a good bit, you know, but there's still so much more we need and there's no substitute for time. 
we all just need you know to, to continue to follow the story out um, for a bit longer and you know, get a better sense of what's going on and and throwing in all the variants that are occurring now too I think is another layer of complexity in all of this and making it a harder to kind of get a grasp on right now so um, but just want to give you a sense of where where the data stands at the moment. So with that, I want to leave you all with some uh, resources that we used for today's presentation or resources I think would be very helpful if you have any other questions. Um, the Parkinson's Foundation has a very easy to read understanding COVID and understanding Parkinson's. It's, it's um, one of my favorites, I have to say. I would yeah. definitely recommend checking that out. Yep. Um, I, I've got two papers posted here, one that's in the Journal of Parkinson's Disease. The other one is in a neurological journal. Um, the one that's in the Journal of Parkinson's Disease is probably the most thorough review of all the studies that have come out to date, the quality studies that have come out to date. So it's a really long read if you ever feel really, really bored or want to put yourself to sleep. But the data in there is really solid and contributed a lot to today's presentation. Uh, the one that I have the Michael J. Fox Foundation logo next to, that's the publication of the results of their massive okay. surveys. And then lastly, of course, we have the CDC page on COVID-19, which is always the best place to get the latest information on what's going on with our knowledge of COVID-19. Um, we had a request for um, the, the paper that you have with like the tennis ball with the snooping around it. Um, so we can share that one as well. Oh, yes. So actually we can... Um, I can go back up there really quick for people that, oh no. My computer did not do what I wanted it. Um, so that paper is cited right here in the corner. This interactions between SARS-CoV-2 and protein is called amyloid formation. Um, I'm gonna be honest, it's not a great paper, um, at least to me from a scientific standpoint, um, because there's probably a lot of proteins out there we can throw in a, in a tube with synuclein and cause its aggregation. It's a protein that's prone to aggregation, quite frankly. Um, the fact that the N protein does it and the S protein doesn't is an interesting note that we need to pay attention to. Um, but don't put too much stock in this paper just yet. There's more science that needs to be done. But, but we're happy to provide the reference though, so you can- Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Everyone needs to know everything that's going on. Um, but as always, you know, not everything is good science. And it's, it's, it's true, which is why I have the massive review paper that's also cited at the end. Because it does its best to try to sort out what's good and bad. And we can, we can, I put a few links for um, some of the biomarker um, data that's coming out um, in the, the chat as well. But we can, we can send these things through, through KC too. Oh yeah, and of course they'll be on the recorded, um, the recorded presentation that ends up on YouTube later, which I just discovered was on YouTube last night, and realized, oh hey, I'm on YouTube. So, <laughs> so do we have any other questions? I, I haven't looked at the chat yet. So it's hard when you're presenting. Um, yeah. Dr. Bernstein's work, um, Dr. Sackner Bernstein. I, I, I am not, but um, can definitely educate educate ourselves. Yes. Um, yeah, I don't have an answer for that one. Donna, is there anything in particular um, from from that work that you were interested in? Um, there's a there's a talk coming up by him. Boy, I'm echoing. What am I echoing? Sorry about that. I'll mute this. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. There's a talk coming up by him. He has a totally different idea on Parkinson's that it's an over excess of dopamine between the cells, not a lacking of dopamine and he's looking at an amino acid tyrosine. was that tyrosine. tyrosine as a way of curing it and he's giving a talk coming up in london i think it's on the content.isopress.com estimates of inter intracellular dopamine in parkinson's disease 
a systematic review and meta-analysis. And there's a research article. I can maybe put a link in there. It's interesting because I, I think both uh, Victor and I are early days in research. We're looking at um, causing Parkinson's by giving dopamine. Um, and I think that this is actually quite in line with a lot of very early work, you know, actually going back to like the sixties, this has been a theory that's been out there. You know, and part of the issue is that dopamine itself is very um, reactive and it's easily um, changed by um, the oxidative state of the cell. And this has actually been a theory as to why dopamine cells in particular are vulnerable in someone with Parkinson's. It also turns out that the, you know, because if you recall the dopamine neurons in the nigra are in an older part of, of the brain, that these are cells that just don't have the equipment, let's say to handle extra stress. And then you throw dopamine in there and by itself can be somewhat toxic if it's not handled well. And so, yes, it's, it's not, it's the mishandling of dopamine, let's say, I think has been a theory that's been out there for quite a while. But um, I was raised in a lab where the model that we used was actually just dopamine itself, causing really selective loss of, of dopamine terminals. So I, there's something to this, absolutely. So um, one, I think this would be something that would be great for more discussion next time. Mm. Um, but I just quickly looked up um, some of uh, Dr. Jonathan Sackner Bernstein's work. And quite frankly, it's nothing new. This, what he's proposing is exactly what Dr. Terry Hastings, Dr. Teresa Hastings at the University of Pittsburgh, who's still there, has been studying for almost 30 years. Uh, Dr. Hastings was a mentor to both me and Amber. And you know, she proposed well, it's... from the beginning and has been studying this idea that dopamine mishandling and excess dopamine is what drives Parkinson's disease. Now what um, Dr. Sackner Bernstein is, he's extending this to, if that's the case, which he believes it is as well, then we've been treating PD patients wrong. And this has actually been a bit I'm, of controversy for I've some time. Yep. Yep. Because we don't actually see an acceleration of Parkinson's in patients that get L-DOPA, but okay. we don't- You don't really know. know. <laughs> almost everybody ends up on the dopa Right. I see an acceleration of the symptoms if you start taking a lot of dopamine. I see it. And then DBS allows you to cut back on your medicines. And I'm wondering, is that why you're getting better? Because you're taking less of this toxic substance that we're forcing through the blood-brain barrier and it does not handle it. But DBS is enhancing dopamine augmentation. It's, it's causing stimulation to release more dopamine. And so though you may not be getting it through the pills necessarily, it's still, dopamine still flowing through the system. It's just being electrically stimulated rather than just by, by medicine. And I'm gonna tell you like, this is a really hard question to ask. And it's something I, I actually was trying to explore in animal models. And I think no one wants to know the answer, frankly, which is not the right way to go about it. But I think that there's this a fear. Uh, you know, and I, and I will also add that I think what, we, what we're talking about right now is there are hot topics and Parkinson's that come and go. And this is, I think, hopefully maybe a cycle coming back to this question again. And I think some of the fear is based off of like what I've been told before is, well, what else are we going to do? I know you'll become stiff as a board. We have no other solutions, but maybe he's discovering an amino acid. We got to delete the, pro the alpha synuclein proteins. We got to detox the brain and have the brain recover. I, I don't know. I'm just thinking that there's a different approach that... We haven't gotten anywhere in 70 years, just giving them dopamine. Yeah, you know? um, and I, that's what I was going to add is I think, you know, no one's been wanting to answer this question because there's been no other tools in order to address Parkinson's. And I, I would like to argue, I feel like we are getting to a point where there are some new and novel things to try, in which case maybe we can start to, you know, re-ask that question in a, in a smarter way. So I, there's something, there's something to it. There's a reason those cells in particular are, are affected. And, and I think we just now have the, even the scientific tools to understand why, but now we need to start asking that question again. Uh, a couple of things I would want to point out though is, um, I mean, there has been work on trying to reduce alpha synuclein, but that is, it's not just a bad protein. It's actually a protein that the cells need to survive. It's just when it starts doing bad things that 
we have issues. And we still don't really understand what is causing it to go bad, but just completely getting rid of it may not be the answer either. We actually uh, saw this with Alzheimer's and the Adjuhelm issue mm -hmm. when they removed that pro they're really good at taking that protein away, but it caused a lot of other problems that we're just now really starting to see. So there's, it's there, you know, it's, it's made in our brains for a reason. It was put there for a reason. The, the question is, you know, what's the balance? And I, I think, you know, we just haven't been sophisticated enough to ask that question. Um, but I think it's been more and more clear that you can't just wipe it out, that that, that actually may be more causing more harm than good. And we could talk about the, the whole dopamine, L-dopa, uh, tyrosine thing more. I, I think that would be an excellent thing to do next time, because I don't think we've ever really talked about Terry's work in, in this forum. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we could talk about dopamine, 6 dopamine, all that kind of stuff. But um, for uh, Dr. Bernstein's work, I think his whole idea of using tyrosine, tyrosine is actually also a precursor for dopamine. Dopamine, um, dopamine is made from L-dopa, which is made from tyrosine. Um, so I'm, based on what I'm reading, I, I think his idea is rather than just get massive amounts of dopamine made from a bolus of L-dopa, just to boost dopamine production by going farther upstream and starting with tyrosine. But the end result is still more dopamine. Correct. Because that's what's missing. Dopamine is gone and that's what's causing the symptoms. So he's just trying to address it a slightly different way. May that work? I don't know, I'm not a doctor. Um, so time will tell. I'm not that kind of doctor, I should point out. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Any other questions? Another amazing, interesting topic. And it sounds like we have a topic for next month, perhaps. I just saw a mention about having COVID-19 and really okay. prolonged um, mm. symptoms of fatigue. And I am, I'm not surprised, but, mm. but it, what, what, I, what I also am reading here is that things kind of did eventually get back to, to where they were before. So that's really critical. And again, it's very similar to what we were saying earlier, where you know, it's there, it worsens the things that were there, um, but should get you back to baseline. Um, I'm sorry, it took so long. Hmm. Well, thanks everyone for joining. We'll see you next month, same date. Awesome. Same time. Hey, everybody, have a good weekend. Have a good weekend, Thank everyone. everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.